Uh, we want to go to Acts chapter 10, the last part of Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. And until God tells me different, I'm preaching through the book of Acts, is what, is what we're doing. And I did stray away from that one week, because the Lord had a different message. And I'm open. I'm open to the Lord. I'm not bound by serious preaching or whatever. We, we actually come every Thursday night. We pray. And one of the things that, that my focus on Thursday nights is I check in with the Lord and say, okay, is this okay to preach this? Is this, is this what you have? What? And, and if, if God interrupts it, and he has before, he has interrupted it before. Uh, there's been several times where I wanted to preach something, and he told me that he wanted me to preach something that he wanted me to preach. And I didn't like what he wanted me to preach. And I argued with him a little bit. And and I've learned that you should probably be obey. Because, because when I, there's been a couple times where I argued with him, and I, and I thought I won, and I preached what I wanted to preach, and there was just like flat. It was just like no anointing, you know. And uh, yeah, it's very difficult. So sometimes God tells me to preach on things that I don't really, I'm not really comfortable with. But He's not concerned with my comfort. He is concerned with you and what's best to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who believe. So uh, this is about the Holy Spirit falling. So, so this will be very educational for some, a reminder to others. And this is Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Peter opened his mouth to these Gentile believers. Uh, you know, God gave him a vision to go here. And, and, and Cornelius was a centurion, and, and he had a visitation of an angel that told him to send for Peter to come preach to him. And Peter came diligently. The Holy Spirit led him to, to come to these guys and to preach to him. And verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and he said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So good, so good. Now skip down to verse 44, Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. How did they know that? Because something happened as an outward display or evidence that the Holy Spirit had fallen on the Gentiles. The next verse says what it was. Verse 46, For they heard them speak with tongues, yeah. And magnify God. And Peter answered, "Can anyone forbid water that these should not be, or that those should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have?" And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay for a few days to continue teaching them and helping them in their new faith with the Lord. But uh, tongues. Now tongues. Is obvious. It's an old English word, an archaic English word in the Old King James Bible, and and it's it's the same as if I said languages. I would say the word in Old King James tongues. They speak with different tongues, okay? But in the Bible, in, in what's you know modern day tongues have come to know know is what Pentecostals and Charismatics do when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak in a and, and some people would say gibberish, but we know that it's an articulate language. It's a heavenly language. And Paul says, though I speak with the language of men and angels and have not love, I'm just a sounding brass. According to the Apostle Paul, it could be an angry, a language of men, like German or French or English. Or it could be a language of angels. But it is an articulate language of some sort. So... The, the trick is, though, is this word, glossolalia, is different than the Greek word dialect, dialectos. Dialect is a language that you've learned. If you've gone to high school and you learned Spanish and you know how to speak Spanish because you studied it and you learned it, that's dialect. Glossolalia is speaking a language that you have not learned. Okay, see the difference? So tongues is not a language that you know. If you speak in tongues supernaturally, that means you're speaking in a language that you've never studied and learned. You, you don't even know anything about the language. 
It's a miracle that you're speaking a language other than something that you know. Okay? So, so they heard them speaking with this language, that, and they knew that this was tongues. Yeah. You yeah. said I'd make it very clear. Everybody's looking at me really funny right now. Where am I going with this? <clears throat> now, we are what we call a Pentecostal church. We're an Assembly of God church. The Assemblies of God was birthed in, in the uh, like 1920s, 1919, 1920s. And it was based, 1914. Thank you, she just studied for her licensing, so she, know, <laughs> she knows that. So, 1914. But the Assemblies of God has its origins in what they call the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles, Cal you know, in Anaheim, Los Angeles, California area. And the Azusa Street Revival was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the 20th century. And at that, at that particular revival, the Holy Spirit poured out so mightily that people were regularly getting what they called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Different than baptism in water. It's where, where John the Baptist said, I baptize with water, but he who's coming after me, whose sandals I'm not worthy to unlatch, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, he says, wait in Jerusalem to be baptized by the Holy Spirit for the power on high, power to be witnesses, right? right? And Jesus called it a baptism in the Holy Spirit. So it's not salvation. So it's not baptism in water. It's a fundamental thing that you and I need besides salvation. After you get saved, or actually right when these people did get saved, you need the power of God to walk the walk. You need the power of God to be a bold witness for Christ. Without it, you will be lame. You'll, you'll be walking. It, it, it's like going to war with only a few bullets and not having having everything you need to be successful. You may struggle. You may be successful. You'll make it to heaven for sure. There's many uh, wonderful Christians without it. But why not have it if it's available? Why not get it, especially if Jesus commanded us to have it? Okay. So, in, in uh, Acts, okay, five times in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is poured out in the book of Acts. Now, in 1900, there was a small Bible college in Topeka, Kansas. And this, this, this fellow named Charles Parham, he was the head of the Bible college. And he had a few students, and he said, he said okay, what we're going to do is we're all going to study independently. I want everybody to read the whole entire book of Acts. We'll come back, you know, in a couple days. And, and I want you to tell me what the evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is. Because we see that it's something different than what we're taught. You know, we see that the Bible is, is this. At that particular time, nobody was teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They just figured the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring at Pentecost, was just the Holy Spirit coming and helping the church. They, had, they didn't think that it was anything different than salvation. Just the Holy Spirit empowerment for the early church. So, but they saw that this was something different. So, so they went and independently they came back and they said, listen, Mr. Parham, what we see is there's five times that the Holy Spirit is, give, is poured out and is given in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, tongues was manifested. Acts chapter 8, 17 through 18, they, they went to the Sumerian church and Peter and John came after they were saved, after they were baptized in water, Peter and John came to give them something else. And when they laid hands on their head, the, the, uh, the false prophet saw, you know, he saw something, Simon the false prophet, he saw something on the, that happened and then he wanted to buy it with money. It doesn't say tongues there, but we know that there was an outward sign when people, when people received something. Acts chapter 9, verses 17 through 18, the third time the Holy Spirit was given. Paul, was they had laid hands on him, and scales fell off his eyes, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't say that he spoke in tongues, but we know that he spoke in tongues, because in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 18, he says, I speak in tongues more than you all. Okay? The fourth time was Acts chapter 10, 46, right here, where... 
tongues was a sign of the Holy Spirit. And the next one is Acts chapter 19, 6, where, the whole, where tongues again showed up after Paul laid hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. So they said it's pretty much overwhelmingly evidence in the Bible that tongues is the initial physical evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now some people uh, would say, are you saying that unless a person speaks in tongues that they don't have the Holy Spirit and they're not saved? No. No, that's not what we're saying. It's not what the Bible teaches. There's a difference between when a person gets, if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you're not His. When you get saved, water goes into your glass. This glass is you. Okay, use your imagination. Put your imagination caps on. The glass is you. The water is the Holy Spirit when you first get saved. You get some Holy Spirit in you. The word baptized means to be totally immersed in something. So now we take this, this glass with some water in it, and we immerse it in a bucket of water or an ocean of water. That is the difference between being saved and being baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, everybody with me on that? Because if you say that tongues is, you can't say that tongues is the evidence of salvation. The evidence of salvation is, is, a, is an, a life that appreciates God and loves God and worships the Lord. Right? That's the evidence of salvation. But the evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the, one of the main, one of the things is, is tongues. Now, there's other evidences as well. But this is what we call the initial evidence. Can a person be, be baptized in the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues? That may be possible, but I would say that it's resident within you and that we can pray to have your tongue loosed. Because it's for everyone or it's for no one. God shows no partiality. Remember that scripture up there? He shows no favoritism. Okay, so you'll notice that when they spoke with tongues, when the Holy Spirit fell on them, there was no interpreter. What was that all about? Because there is a distinction between a tongues that is in the gift of tongues, spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, that needs to be interpreted, and private devotional prayer tongues. Praying to the Lord in the Holy Ghost, in your spirit. There's a distinction between those two things. In the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul was, was telling them, he says, he says, you know, in, in church, you know, instead of disturbing the church service, it, it better be a message in tongues that needs to be interpreted. So, so if he's telling them that they should what they should shouldn't do in church, they shouldn't pray in tongues and or you know, pray in tongues loudly and disturb the church service with tongues. It's assumed that they're doing it on their own. Outside of church. In their private devotional time. And Paul says, I speak in tongues more than y'all. He says, I pray in the Spirit. And then I pray in my understanding. I sing in the Spirit. And then I sing in my understanding. Right? He says, I will pray in the Spirit. And I will pray in my understanding. So therefore, once you have tongues, it's not its not just waiting for the Spirit to come on. Once you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you have the, 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 uh, you have the prayer language, you don't have to wait for the Spirit of God to come on you to prompt you to pray in tongues. It's an act of your will from that moment forward. It's not based on feelings anymore. You have received a gift from God that you can activate anytime that you will. To be scripturally accurate. So there's a lot of false thinking about the Holy Spirit. And about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And about praying in tongues. We want to take our thinking and put it according to the Bible. Now, I really don't care about the criticisms that I used to, I tell you, I've experienced every persecution you could possibly imagine about being a tongue talker. I've had people angry with me. I've had people tell me that that it's a sin for me to allow people to pray in tongues in church. That I've had people tell me that I was crazy, that I was somehow insane. I've had pastors, local pastors from up north, stand up in their pulpit and declare that our church was crazy. We've had, I mean, I've had everything you could possibly imagine thrown at me. And all I have to say is, 
This word will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but this word, as long as this word teaches about how to please God, as long as this word teaches that there is a power, that there is a baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I will want it. I will do it. I don't care about man's pride. I don't care about, about people looking weird or whatever. I'll tell you, I will be yet more undignified than this if it means pleasing the Lord. Speaking in tongues is the ultimate humbling of yourself. Ultimate. Besides receiving Jesus Christ, the next most humbling thing you're going to do is pray in the Holy Ghost. When you pray in the Holy Ghost, you are humbling your mind under Christ. I submit to you, Lord. I don't have to know it all. A person who says they do not need the Holy Spirit to pray, they do not need to pray in tongues to have a successful prayer life, it's not totally true. They, if you really think about this, it's a very prideful statement. Now listen to me, track with me. What they are saying is I can capture the will of the Holy Spirit I can, with my mind. I can figure out everything that God wants me to pray. And I can pray successfully and articulate it in my limited English language without God's help. Good for you. <laughs> But I'll tell you, the Bible says, I, I don't know what to pray for. As I ought to pray. I need the Holy Spirit to help me. And He prays according to the perfect will of God. So why would I not want the Holy Spirit to help me pray? What would happen if God wants to transcend or go beyond my limited language? What if there was something that God wanted to pray about, but I didn't have the words for it? I, I, I don't know how to pray. Thank God. He's given me a heavenly language. I can now pray according to the perfect will of the Holy Spirit and bypass my limited vocabulary. Yeah. Yeah. And express, God can express through me what He wants to pray. Right. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. To submit to that is the ultimate humbling on your part. To submit to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to pray for you and trust Him to pray for you pray through you for the will of God is an ultimate humbling. You, I'll tell you, the pride of man wants to figure everything out. The pride of man wants to have God in a box. The pride of man wants to be able to control God. The pride of man wants to have all the principles and all the things just laid out in front of him so that if I do thus and thus and thus, this will be the response. If I do thus and thus and thus every time, this will always be the response. Everybody with me? That way we're in control. We're not in control. <laughs> as much as I tried to figure it out, I wish I had the easy principles all the time. Some of them are pretty clear principles. But sometimes you'll never figure out God totally. You might as well humble yourself now and allow Him to pray to you in tongues. You might as well do You might as well surrender now the fact that you don't know. I don't know how. To, I, there's been situations people come up to me and they go, so and so is dying. 92 years old. How should we pray, Pastor? I don't, I don't know how to pray for this. So praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Pretty soon it, it comes to me how to pray for the, for the situation. Yeah, right. Pretty soon God will give me the interpretation of what I'm praying for if I ask Him for it. Yeah. Yeah. If I can handle it. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I want, I want to show you a scripture there. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Starting with verse 1, it says, Pursue love, that's the character of God, and desire spiritual gifts, that's the the prophetic gifts, the Holy Spirit. We're to have both. The prophetic gifts of the Holy Spirit and the character, the love character. But especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. So when you're speaking in tongues and you don't understand me, it's because you're not supposed to. It's not to you. It is to God. But I don't understand what you're saying. It's, it has, who cares? It's not even to you. It's to God. 
However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. The word mysteries is divine secrets. Oh, that's kind of cool, isn't it? Divine secrets. Praise God's secrets to him. Verse 3, but he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in tongues, look, look at this verse, he edifies himself. Edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. People go, well, it's, it's just not wrong to edify yourself. You should never think about getting yourself strong in the Lord. You should only think about others all the time. How many know that that's religious thinking right there? That's right there. How many know that I have to receive grace before I can give grace? Yeah. Yeah. That I have to be built up so I can help others. I have to be blessed so I can be a blessing. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. What does the word edify? That comes from the word edifice. When you think of a tall building, you know, like the, the World Trade Center used to be, or, or like the new World Trade Center, whatever it's called now. Like the Sears Tower. It's a huge edifice. So when you're praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit, you're opening up, widening the capacity in your heart to receive a greater revelation from God, to receive more of God. You're, you're opening, you're building, building your... Okay, everybody with me? You're, there's an edifice, there's something happening. You're building yourself up in the faith and you're, and you're expanding your capacity to want to, to receive from the Lord. Jude, verse 20. Can you look up that verse for me? Now? Building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Wow. Could it be that simple, Norm? That all I have to do is pray in tongues, build myself up in faith. I, I don't feel full of faith right now. I don't feel... Could it be that simple that we could just start praying in the Holy Ghost yeah. and our and our faith would start getting built up and we'd start getting in faith about something? Whereas before we were we were uh, in fear and in doubt. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you, there, there is uh, some times where you don't feel it. You know, you don't you don't feel like you're God's man or woman of faith and power. You don't feel like you feel like your prayers are just going to hit the ceiling and come bouncing back down. You don't feel like if you lay hands on the sick that they're going to recover. As a matter of fact, you're not even sure it will ever happen. Well, if, if that ever happens to you, you don't, you don't know if God's going to provide. All of a sudden, you're doubting whether God even loves you or can provide for you at all. Well, thank God that I have the gift of praying in tongues. I don't ask myself how I feel. Do I feel like praying in tongues right now? I just start doing it. And I start praying in tongues. And somebody will hear me praying in tongues with my kids. Why are you praying in tongues, Dad? Does there have to be a reason to pray in the Holy Ghost? Can't I just pray whenever I feel like I'm just hungry for God? Or want to build myself up in the Lord? Just pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. When you're doing windshield time and you've got driving time, you pray in the Holy Ghost. <coughs> when you're at work and the machinery is real loud, pray in the Holy Ghost. When you're at school, walk down the hall. Pray in the Holy Ghost. They'll think you're a foreign exchange student. No one will care. When you're at home and watch TV, pray in the Holy Ghost. You can still watch TV and pray in the Holy Ghost. Wow. Of course, then you might end up turning the TV off. <laughs> yeah. When temptation comes, pray in the Holy if the Bible is true, and I believe it is, and I know you believe it is, why don't we see it and just look at it and just accept what it says? Why don't, why don't we just argue with it all the time? If the Bible says that your tongue in James chapter 3 is the, is the, the steering mechanism of your entire life, why don't we believe that? Why do we keep speaking death and destruction over things? But I'll tell you, you got something that can overrule the carnality of your false prophesying mouth. And that is praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in tongues. It usurps my unbelief. It usurps my negative speaking and believing. It turns the ship back on the right course. 
isn't that what the Bible says? That the tongue steers our lives? Yeah. Isn't that what it says? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should be praying in tongues all the time. Yeah. What am I doing? I'm refusing to pray in tongues. <laughs> That irritates me. Yeah. I, I remember I used to have this uh, impossible mission for us, I called them, and I, I says, okay, I'm going to need some volunteers to be part of this program. I'm going to teach you to get radical with God. But I'll tell you, in the first month, most of you that volunteer for this program will not be in the program. This program is not like church where everybody's welcome. This program is like the Navy SEALs of, of Christianity where we are trying to get you to quit. Because we only want the most radical, the mo ones that really want it to work the most. I'm heavy signed away reform so your parents won't fire me. And everybody's know what's going on here because some of you are really going to be mad at me if you, if you sign up for this course, but you're going to have to take it. I said, sure, okay. So some of them, some of the foolish ones decided to sign up for the course. No. And uh, the first lesson was praying in the Holy Ghost. I said, everybody stand up. They said, oh, I stand up. Stand up. Pray in the Holy Ghost. What do you mean? Pray in tongues. Pray in tongues right now. I don't know how to pray in tongues. What did you sign up for the course for? Well, well, that we're going to pray for you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit right now. And if you do not pray in tongues right now, there's the door. You're not welcome in this course. This course is about the radical. Do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want the fullness of God? Did a little teaching? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Lift up your hands to heaven. And when I lay hands on you, start praying in tongues. I don't know how. Of course you don't know how. It's the Holy Spirit, but you have to move your lips. You have to let some syllables come out, and then God will take over. Okay, okay. Lift your hands up. Pray, lay hands on them. Everybody go, yeah, yeah, they're all excited. That's it. Now pray in tongues. Everybody pray in tongues. Everybody's standing. They're praying loud in tongues. We're all praying loud. Five minutes goes by. Some of them stop praying. Why, why did you stop praying in tongues for them? I, I don't know. I just didn't feel like doing it. Did I ask whether you felt like doing that or not? I need you to pray in tongues. I didn't tell you to quit. Pray in tongues. And so the group kept praying in tongues. Kept praying in tongues. Five minutes. Ten minutes. They're all looking at me like, when is it time to eat, Pastor? Because teenagers, that's what they only think for the next meal. That's as far as, as they think to. And, I said, no, keep praying in tongues. Pretty soon, something lifted from the room. Yeah. This great peace of the Holy Spirit came yeah. whooshing yeah. through the room. Yeah. Yeah. Stop praying in tongues now. And they were like, what's that? Like somebody get blessed. <laughs> Why they do that? I don't know. I don't know why they do that. Just they feel God, and and the Holy Spirit's on them, and they're, the peace of God's on them. I said, you guys feel that? Go, yeah, we feel that. It says, never forget it. Never forget what you're feeling right now. You can have that anytime you want if you're willing to pray the price. If you're willing to pray in the Holy Ghost and pray through to the peace of God, you can have that. And they said, okay, Pastor, lesson received. The next week came by. Classic yet. Everybody stand up. You know, so that's, so they're praying the Holy Ghost. I mean, everybody's praying in the Holy Ghost. Wow, they're fervent now. They're praying in the Holy Ghost. They see, they see that there's something to this. That there's 
There's something that's going to happen. You know, if they pray in the Holy Ghost. That, that God's going to do something if they pray in the Holy Ghost. That, that, that God's going to set them free. That, that all of a sudden they're in faith. That all of a sudden their lives, they're feeling like their lives are lined up with the Holy Spirit. That their lives are lined up with God. They start praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Pretty soon, they stop. And they start prophesying. Tongues and interpretation starts coming forth. They're prophesying over each other. I said, how did this happen? I'll tell you how it happened. Because you opened up the gate of the prophetic by praying in the Holy Ghost. That's why the Holy Spirit is the initial sign of, of the, the tongues is the initial sign of the Holy Spirit. It's a gateway to the yeah. gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It gets you in the Spirit. Yeah. It gets you to the point where you are moving in the prophetic. You are moving in the power of God. Guys brought the preach on me. Good job. I tell you, I see people not walking in victory. And they could have, they could have the Holy Spirit and they don't want it. They don't want the Holy Spirit. I say, why? I'm not gonna be one of those tongue talkers. I tried it once and I couldn't speak in tongues. Well, in the words of Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> the great prophet of Star Wars. <laughs> this is why you fail. We don't try. We do. That wasn't an exact quotation, by <laughs> How bad do you want it? How bad do you want victory? Some people, I, I just, I just don't see any fight in them. I just don't see any spark of life where they just want it. You know, I mean, I mean, uh, I, I remember, you know, sometimes we'd have these these kids in karate class, and 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 we'd we'd get, get ready to go sparring, you know, bam, right in the face, and the kid go, "What'd you do that for?" We're sparring. <laughs> Put your arm up and block the punch. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, then we'd get going, and they would just quit so easily, and they would just, they were like, it, it was like a fawn being cornered by a mountain lion. They were just all of a sudden shaking and giving up so easy. Like, what, what are you doing? Don't you want to live? <laughs> You need to pull out something, some kind of fight out of you. You need to pull something out of you. It's, you know, I mean, I mean, why? Do you just want to lay down and die? And, and I see so many Christians just want to lay down and die for the devil. And somehow they justify and say it's God's will that they just receive all this. And you go, why don't you fight? God giving you the Holy Ghost. He's giving you the Holy Spirit. You can pray in the Holy Spirit. You can overcome. You can receive victory. Okay, turn to ch chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verse 7, if you would. Chapter 1, verse 7. When I, when I first went into a, a full gospel church, I call it, because they preach the whole gospel, not just part of it. And, and I went to a full gospel church, and I was raised Lutheran. I was raised in a very conservative Lutheran church, uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran church. Very traditional, very conservative. And, and so, you know, my mind of what Christianity was, you know, I was very limited. And, and it was a good church. They, they loved the Lord there. But I was never exposed to any of this stuff. I never even knew it existed. As a matter of fact, I didn't even read my Bible. I just, you know, you didn't read your Bible much in Lutheran church. You just went to church and let the guy preach to you. And that was pretty much it. And hopefully, in our church, that we're reading our Bibles. You know? Hopefully, you've got a Bible through your program and you're reading your Bibles. Uh, so, so uh, uh, you know, when I went to this Pentecostal church, they started speaking in tongues, and I didn't know what was going on. Nobody explained anything to me like I'm explaining it to you. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't even know it was in the Bible. 
And uh, and then and then uh, so I had a lot of questions after that. And I and and some people there's churches and pastors nowadays whenever they get interviewed to be to be Assembly of God ministers, they ask them questions about about the Holy Spirit and about. Do you believe tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, they said, well, what do you feel about the Holy Spirit in your church? About prophecy and things like that? And most of them are afraid to allow the Holy Spirit to move in their church services. Because, because they're like, well, if I want a big church, I should, I should quench the Holy Spirit. Not let the Holy Spirit, you know, do anything. If I want a bigger church. Now, if I want weird in a small church... Then I should then I should uh, let the Holy Spirit move, and that seems to be the general consensus. And I and I got this this book right now by this guy, who pastors a church of over a thousand people, and he has five or six satellite churches, and he allows the Holy Spirit to move in his church, and his church is very successful. And I took that I know that that's a sign because I know that the Holy Spirit is raising up churches that are going to allow the Spirit of God to move again. And that people need healings. People need visitations of God. People need displays of the power of the Holy Spirit. And people are hungry for more of the Lord. And not wanting to just settle for a little dabble, do you? Get my religious fix and go home. I tell you, I don't even want to go to church if that's what church is all about. Just get my religious fix and go home. I, why go to church unless you're going to meet with God? Why go to church unless God is going to encounter you in some way and enrich your life? <clears throat> right? I, don't, I never, I had to make a covenant with I don't even go to church for people. Although you're supposed to love people and have fellowship with the brethren. I had to make that choice a long time ago that my reasons for going to church were because God told me to do it. Had nothing to do with whether you like me or I like you or we like each other or anything. It had completely to do with what the Bible told me to do and doing it because God said to do it. It's the same thing with tongues. When I saw that it was in the Bible, I said, how do I sign up? How do I do it? I didn't, I didn't sit there and have long debates. I remember guys in Bible college trying to talk the Holy Spirit out of me. Well, you know, they come up with all these different things. We shouldn't prophesy because prophesying is, is like adding, we don't add any, prophecy is the Bible and, and we don't want to add to the Bible, you know, we're not adding new books to the Bible by prophesying. I says, you, you, have no, you don't even understand what you're talking about. You know, prophecy is not adding to the Bible. Why would it be judged if it's adding to the Bible? You know, it's judged because it's, it's like a preacher. And I, I, said, I said, if the Bible is all we need, why does your preacher in your church just stand up and why does he just read scripture and then sit down and y'all go home? Why does he give the interpretation? Why does he share with you doctrine and, and teaching about it? Isn't that extra biblical? Isn't that, is he adding to the Bible in some way? I says, uh, the preaching of Jesus is as a spirit of prophecy, isn't it? Yeah. Shut him right up. I said, I says, I'll tell you what. I'm going to believe in prophecy because I've been I've been set free by some prophetic words. Some people knew some things about me yeah. that they could only know by the Holy Spirit, and they prophesied some things over me that I needed. And if, if I didn't believe in prophecy or allow prophecy, there has been much enrichment that has been lost out of my life because I didn't yet have a word from God, an insight into my life. Come on, church. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm going to close with this, but I'm going to show you this. 1 Corinthians 1, 7. He says, he says, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Waiting, the revelation would be the second coming, the second coming of Jesus. And that you come behind in no, in no gift. That word gift is the word uh, charismata. That's the same word used in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. It says, uh, desire, love, and pursue spiritual gifts. Charismata. So this verse really shows that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are until Jesus comes. They didn't die out with the last apostle. Okay? I can't even think of a more worse false teaching than that. 
that has robbed the body of Christ of so much power and so much life is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have stopped with the apostles. I, I just can't even fathom the ridiculousness of that. I remember thinking about the Apostle John on his deathbed, dying, 90 years old, a lineup of people to get healed because he was the last apostle. And finally, he said, love one another. <laughs> and that was it, he died. That's it, folks. No more prayer, no more healing. You can all go home. No more gifts of the Spirit, no more prophecy. Last apostle's dead. That's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I think the reason why people I think the reason why people why people believe that is because of unbelief. They're afraid of the power of the Holy Spirit. They're afraid that they might not be in control. Nothing scares a pastor more than not being in control, don't you know that? I've lost control a long time. I don't even, I don't, I don't, I don't even pretend to have control. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. As a matter of fact, let's stand up if we could. How many of you here? <clears throat> I need to show of hands. How many here have a heavenly language and speak in tongues? Let me see. Let me see your hands. Okay. Uh, raise your hands to heaven. I'm gonna pray for filling for you, fresh filling. Because in Acts chapter four, they, although they were baptized, they received a fresh filling from the Lord. So there's one baptism, many subsequent fillings and anointings. Lord, I just pray for a fresh filling, Lord, on your church. And all those, Lord, that have the Holy Spirit, that have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that, that speak in heavenly language. Okay, if you speak in tongues, I want you to pray in the Spirit to yourself and the Lord right now. There's no way you can pray in the Spirit and not be heard by the person next to you. It's impossible. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are just breaking every norm of church growth right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Come on. Keep praying, church. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord. Every rule of church growth is being broken right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hear their prayers, God. Hear the longings of their heart, God. Fill your church. Fill your church. Build your church, Lord Jesus. Build your church. You said it was desirable that you go away so that the Holy Spirit comes and teaches us and helps us. We need your help, Lord. We need your strength to live and to do good. Some people are coming into a joy right now that they haven't experienced in a while. And, uh, it's okay to laugh at church. It's okay to laugh at church. Despondency is leaving in Jesus' name because, because you're delivering yourself by praying in the Holy Ghost. Depression is leaving. Hopelessness is going. Thank you. It's replaced by new life, new hope. Wells being uncapped, people's spirits. God says nothing is impossible with Him. No dream is impossible with Him.
he had been out of prison for a while. He had murdered somebody and was sent to prison. And when he was in, he was abandoned as a child. He, he was fatherless, and he was full of anger. And he, he had murdered, I don't know how many people, but one he got caught for. And he went to prison, and when he was in jail, in prison, excuse me, these these uh, Pentecostal, these from these African American Pentecostals got a hold of him, and they prayed for him to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And he went back in his cell, and he couldn't stop praying in the Holy Ghost in his cell. He prayed and wept and prayed and wept for hours, and he felt. He said, he, "This is his testimony." He said he felt demons leaving his soul. He felt demonic forces leaving him, and the anger was gone. And he said, he said, Pastor Al, I delivered myself by praying in the Holy Ghost. By praying in the Holy Spirit, it delivered me from demonic oppression. Praise the Lord. And he's a preacher today. He's in a different part of the state, but praise the Lord. Isn't that a good testimony? So good. Uh, we're going to dismiss you, but I just want you to know that if, if you don't, if you made that prayer to, to know Jesus, you need to come up and let us pray for him. And if you would like a release of your prayer language or to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, we want to pray for you today. I'm going to pray for you now. You know, don't let this opportunity slip away from you. Why go another day without the victory that the Lord has for you? Thank you, Lord, for this great church. Thank you, Lord, for, for these good people. Thank you, Lord. You, you accept us and you love us, even in our imperfections. Help us to accept and love one another in our imperfections. And be patient and kind and loving caring. Let goodness come from us, God, that the world has not seen. And let it be a witness to you that there is goodness in the world because of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you bless this church as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.